Hey there, hello, hello there. It's Jeff Cutter, historical diamond, with yet another Degrassi video about the shooting. Now, this is going to be different. This is not something that I have done, and this is not something that no, a vampire has done. So basically, um, if you know how I'm saying things, is that you know I I become more analytical with how the Rick Murray sh shooting timeline came. Not a vampire's role is basically putting graphics and video to commentary. But I have found out that this one guy from the Degrassi Reddit community actually did something that I didn't think would happen. Me and Famp probably would not have realized it. Um, so anyway, I'm online. Maybe you hear the clicks and all. So, yeah, this guy by the name of Drog, Drog94, D-R-O-G-G, 94, actually did a thing called Degrassi Time Standstill, a 15-year retrospective. And a lot, like, he did an article of this, and he actually interviewed some people who were involved in the Degrassi shooting timeline. So, basically, um, yeah. Drog says that he wrote a piece on him and all that. So anyway, yeah, so I did all that. So yeah. Um, yeah. Karma 905, cake day, February 2015. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm just looking at Katergaki. That's me. Um, and all that. So yeah, so... Basically, Drog said that, you know, great job. I told Drog, great job on it. And I told him about what I do. And he said he would look at it. So anyway, um, his article, I will give you a link to the article in the, um, in the description if you want to look for yourself. So basically, he did this yesterday on what is called conventionalrelations.net. So that he talks about school shooting. So anyway, this is what he says. <clears throat> it was the fall of 2004. I was a young and restless boy who harbored a fanaticism for depressing the next generation. I sat in front of the TV on Friday night getting ready to watch the newest episode like normal. Well, this must be American because I know for sure Degressing Next Generation didn't really have shows on Fridays in Canada. Anyway, I vividly remember as the episode ended, a trailer began for the new block of episodes. All the promo showed was Rick Murray holding up a gun in slow motion and the screen turning to black as we hear a gunshot. He says, I was in total shock. So going into his fourth season, the show already tackled subject matters as to abortion, sexual assault, child abuse, and self-harm on mothers. Since the Degrassi franchise is broke in 1979 with kids of Degrassi Street, the show was always praised for its ability to realistically depict teenage life and educate viewers on topics not often seen in shows towards younger audiences. However, they were about to feature a storyline that would catapult the show and result in one of the most iconic episodes in the franchise history. In the two-part episode, Time Stands Still, student Rick Murray, played by Ephraim Ellis, is pushed to the edge after being the subject of several, of severe, excuse me, bullying and a humiliating school prank. In retaliation, he decides to bring a gun to school and ends up shooting star athlete Jimmy Brooks, who was actually Drake, before losing his own life after fellow student Sean Cameron, or Daniel Clark, intervenes to stop the shooting. When the episode aired in the United States in 2004, December 2004, I did not, and he goes, I did not realize at this time that episode aired too much earlier in Canada, was I would have hit up one lawyer. I sat and watched disbelief as the episode unfolded. I never thought the show would reach the levels of suspense and urgency it did in this episode. Watching a character get shot was such a jarring thing to see on the grass and something I couldn't wrap my head around. In the 15 years since the episode aired, the issues they explored has sadly become a common reality. Rewatching this as an adult, I feel a level of admiration that Degrassi was able to touch in on an issue so controversial and such in such a layered and well-crafted way. It is still regarded as one of the franchise's best entries. So basically, he decides, he did for the 15th anniversary, he actually spoke to a co-writer, Brandon York, director Stefan Schiani, Sean Cameron, a.k.a. General Clark, and Rick Murray, a.k.a. Ephraim Ellis, 
to reminisce on their memories creating the episode and their thoughts looking back so many years. So he split it up. Part one is Origins. Part <laughs> Time Stands Still, Parts One and Two were written by Aaron Martin and Brendan York. Pursuing a school shooting storyline had always been on the minds of the writers producers since Next Generation, and it came in collaboration for a season. And Brandon goes, I'm going to try to paraphrase as much as I can. There were probably a lot of things going on behind the scenes that led us to finally take a crack at the shooting storyline. It was a topic we knew we would have to address at some point since, unfortunately, unfortunately preparing for dealing with school shootings are things that lots of students in the United States are forced to confront at some point. Basically, they're less routine in Canada, but your news travels north. But fundamental issues of bullying and violence are commonplace in Canada as well. By the fourth season, a few things came together that we felt would facilitate the telling of a dramatic yet balanced school shooting story. We had many of the young actors hit their strides in terms of being able to pull off what was a complicated and emotionally tough storyline. And of course, the writers were trying to find which characters would be involved in it, or if they decided to bring Rick back as the shooter. Everyone thought that they saw Rick, the last of Rick, after season three when he was the culprit of an abusive relationship storyline. Brandon goes, we never thought of creating another character. Rick had a backstory that put him at odds with some of the other characters. So this was, we also felt that we had an actor in Ephraim who could pull off an intense and demeaning storyline. So it was a no-brainer. Ephraim then says, it was a complete surprise because... Rick got ran out of town on a rail by the end of season three, so I wasn't expecting to come back. But I was told by one of the producers that they wanted to tackle a school shooting storyline for a while. But I hadn't found the right character for that story until Rick came along. And I decided to pull it off. As far as which characters would be left to deal with the repercussions, the writers decided to choose on Emma, Sean Spinner, and most of Jimmy, who was paralyzed from the waist down and confined to a wheelchair. Brandon goes, The dynamics between Emma, Sean, Rick, Spinner, and Jimmy were developed to the extent that every one of their points of view could be understood and used to tell an honest story. We saw how life-changing this would be for Jimmy and how it would be a goldmine for future storylines involved in the character. We also knew that Aubrey would be able to shine as an actor, playing a character who had to go through ups and downs in the aftermath. And then the director, Skianis, was chosen to ta direct it. He goes, I was quite delighted when they wanted me to do it. I used to do a lot of the most intense episodes because I'm more of an actor's director, so I like to work with the actors to get their get that performance, to get the honesty, truth, and heart within the scene rather than doing something stylish. The crew wanted to make sure they did the controversial topic justice. Brandon goes, we did a fair bit of research, reading a lot about Columbine in his aftermath. It was complicated. We wanted to show how someone could be bullied to the point of desperation, and we wanted to show how retaliatory and violence is not acceptable. Two wrongs cannot add to rate. And then Stefan goes that Linda Schroeder, who was co-creator of Jurassic, made arrangements to bring in a woman who was helping with the crisis management of Columbine, named Barbara Colosso. And basically, Barbara was helping the writers to find the truth and what was really going on, as opposed to the Hollywood version of it. We want to tell the real story and get into the truth of it, and into what would be going through the young man's head. The episode title, Time Stands Still, was actually a Rush song from 1987, but Brandon says that he liked Rush. Unfortunately, the actual title is Time Stands Still, not Time Stands Still. So I thought there was a song called Time Stands Still with the S, but no. In Part 2 was preparation. When we're kind of aggressive, the actors were kept in the dark about future stories until they wrote the scripts. At table read. Many of the actors did not know that the show was going to have a school shooting. Stefan says that Linda conducted the table reads like an exam. You walk inside at your spot, the script was there, but it was upside down and you couldn't turn it over until Linda said so. So then the cast used to do, which would make them laugh, they would try to look through the back page of the script to see who had the last line in the episode, because whoever had the last line tended to be who the episode was about. So basically, they said that Linda used really thick paper. We don't know who gets the last line. Brandon goes, usually the cast are reading the scripts for the first time the table reads. However, there were exceptions. I'm very sure that Ephraim of Aubrey, a.k.a. Drake, and Mary McDonald, who was Emma, would probably have been given the heads up. It's not just the intense nature of the scripts that leads to this. It's basically characters, look what they would look like if they're being killed off. You know. Daniel Clark, a.k.a. Sean, goes, 
I don't recall the writers or executives disclosing us the issues they hoped to cover that season. So when we sat down with the table read, this was the first time we were aware of the episode that was going to cover school shootings. Degrassi's MO was to cover tough issues for young teenagers, but it was kind of a shock because this one was very important that TV shows didn't deal with. Then Stefan says, I remember as I was watching the actors, there'd be a certain amount of energy and high spirit, but the read got quieter and quieter and very serious. All that. Sean goes, there were never any guarantees with Degrassi. We were all subject to the writers and the decisions they made. After reading the first episode, I thought it was possible that Sean was either killed or maimed in a terrible way. They didn't give us any indication which way it was going to go. And Stefan says, when they read the part about Aubrey getting shot in the back, the kids burst into tears. Everyone was affected. So basically, Efron goes, it was such sensitive material. The topics this arc dealt with was needed preparation. Columbine was fresh in people's memories. And Daniel goes, Daniel Clark goes, I was younger when Columbine happened, and it was something that was talked about. This was not the only example, but this catapulted the idea of mass shootings and school shootings into the consciousness of a lot of people who were growing up at this time. Stephen says it was a raw script, and they needed to embody the story. Ephraim said, I think we all knew how important these episodes were going to end up, and we wanted to do it justice. Characters like Rick are always an incredible experience to play because you get to explore and com create complex and emotional stats. When it comes to getting into a character's mindset, I always try to find that what I have in common. Both Rick and I were feeder dorks in high school, so I started from there so that I would have a jumping off point. And then they decided to do filling. Ephraim says, usually the Degrassi set is laid back, fun and light. But everything got quiet and serious when we were filming the climatic scenes in the hallway with the gun. Stephen says, I told the assistant director that we needed to keep it like the set of a play. I wanted the actors to be focused, and I wanted them to be in tune with the material and the emotions they're going to play. And Daniel goes, we were still friendly, but we were very quiet in between scenes, so we had to get into the moment. Stephen goes, I wanted it to be from the POV point of view of the people who were experimenting. It was shot in the perspective of the players. In other words, where the camera was placed. The height of the camera. Everything was experimental. I had the camera closer to the characters. Trying to observe it. And everyone goes, I spent so much time covered in paint and feathers. If they removed any of it, they had to recreate it for continuity. So it was making sense to just leave it on. It was uncomfortable, but it helped in a weird way because Rick's not in a comfortable place. Daniel Clark says, it was very challenging. Emotions and fear. That's a way to sell it if you're doing a horror uh, film. You know, there's a guy with an axe running around. But this was more nuanced. You have to have the same level of fear come across all, come, without the gimmick, the screaming and the murder. Stephen says, I didn't want to rehearse the actors too much. Typically, if I was doing a scene that after three actors, I would run the scene with them and polish it. But that I made the choice to rehearse them individually and give them their notes, let them think about it. And then I basically say, roll cameras and we'll see what instinct happens. Everyone goes, most of the Degrassi cast didn't, stand, didn't stay in character between takes. But with the scenes, you really have to keep your head with the character to preserve the energy. I needed time to decompress and shake Rick's cobwebs out of my brain at the end of the day. And Daniel Clark says, even though we knew the income, I think we made a point of forgetting the outcome. I think we all wanted to be at a certain level. Seven says, I had sleepless nights because it affected me on a strange level. I had to ask these actors to reach in their psyche and go to a dark place. It was really hard. And then he also adds, there's a couple of double way, different ways of doing shooting scenes. Usually in use shows, you don't see the impact. You could only see after the impact. In this case, I thought it would be important to see the actual impact. Ephraim says, if I'm not mistaken, we had a real gun. Film sets have special experts called gun wranglers to make sure they're dealt with safely. Stephen says, there's a lot of protocols we have to uh, achieve before we put the gun on. The emergency task force were there, and we had special gun wranglers. The gun has to be brought on set, and it has to be shown to all the actors open to where they can see there's no bullets, and every actor had to confirm there's no bullets. Then the actor gets the gun. It was only ever loaded with blanks for the one shot that was fired. And during that shot, the five guys on the camera crew were behind a plexiglass screen and protected blankets because the gun was pointed towards the camera. 
and they said they put a squib, a small squib for an Aubrey, because he was being shot in the back. And all of that. Part four was the aftermath. Why you shoot my boy Drake? The facts of time stand still shaped the rest of the fourth season. And for some characters, the arcs of their tenure at the series. Daniel Clerk, it would mean that his character departed from the show temporarily. He goes, I don't remember if we all agreed whether that was going to happen in the season. I thought it was more natural sort of progression. I thought that Sean was having a breakdown and tried to push the reset button when his life was organic. Having a lack of a reporting figure in his life was a pretty heavy theme. He lived with his brother and then by himself. He came from a broken family. He didn't have a support group after the shooting, but he was mature enough to recognize that he could have dealt he couldn't have dealt with the incident without the support he needed. So basically they won some Canadian awards. And Stefan goes, The subject matter for me was far more important than the accolades. I'm a father of four and two of my kids have had bullying done to them. So this subject was close to my heart and close to my psyche. It was a team effort. For Ever, aka Rick, he was only able to experience the aftermath of the episode with from his interactions with fans. Even though the importance of the episode isn't lost on people, there were some humorous remarks time after time. I still get recognized, he says, to this day. Everyone's positive and effusive about how powerful the episodes were. I also get, bro, why didn't you shoot my boy Drake treating me all the time? I usually tell him because it was in the script. And basically, when they reflected on Time Stand Still, this is what people said. Stefan said, The one thing I enjoyed about working was the support from Linda Scheuer. She believed in us and helped us find the right voice in the story. She would say, Here's what we're going to say and achieve, but please figure it out. Something incredibly important to her were the voices of the young actors. Linda was clear that we had to make these characters absolutely real. Brandon says, It has become an iconic episode. I don't think I changed a thing. Afterwards, we, conduct, we were con contacted by Kawas to tell us that we nailed the interpersonal dynamics of a tragic event, so we did something right. Everyone goes, Degrassi was my first professional TV job. I count myself very lucky that I got to be a part of an important piece of TV as it was my first gig. Fifteen years later, I still t look on that character and that performance as some of my best work. And then Ducard says, I think Degrassi did the issue an incredible amount of justice. With Degrassi, when we covered an issue, there were, there were always consequences. Very real ones. They sometimes embellished a bit, but there's always a lesson to learn. And the lessons are hard ones. The, the, that was our entire focus. I don't think we could have done a better job. So basically, that's all he has to say about it. So yeah, so he took the time, this guy took the time to interview people who were involved in it. I just wish that I could get connections and talk to some people about that. I'll probably just wink at him saying that if he could get connections for some people to talk to me about it, and I would love to talk about it. And my personality, I just want him to, I guess, oh crap, I would say Brandon, but that's not the guy's name. Andrew, I would like to see Andrew set something up. You know, we could be friends and all that to do with this. So anyway, thanks for watching and you know the link to the article will be in the description of the video and I will reach out to the guy and say that I did my video and show him my work. It's not as good as his work, but you know what? He did well. And this is the first time I actually realized that somebody actually took the time to reflect and got, get some people from the shooting timeline. I wish I did that, but obviously I don't have the connections. Or will I? You'll have to wait and find out. I hope.